Today, men first left the protective atmosphere of Earth to walk in the vacuum of the moon. And we may wonder, will our lives ever be the same? Will future generations look back from the Earth, from another planet, from another star, and say, this was the beginning? The year is 1961. The space race is in full swing, and the Soviet Union is enjoying a comfortable lead. Under mounting political pressure in the United States, the freshly elected 35th President John F. Kennedy stands before Congress in 1961, and he declares that they will put a man on the moon before the decade is through. For while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us lost. It was an ambitious project, and even NASA itself wasn't sure they could do it by 1970. In 1963, Kennedy even came close to agreeing a joint Soviet-American mission to the moon to avoid duplication of effort. Space offers no problems of sovereignty. Why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Despite this, NASA was undaunted and remained committed to its quest. How to approach the moon was one of the first big questions. Could you directly fly a spaceship there, go out for a wander, and then zip back to Earth? Or did you need something a little bit more elaborate? The option finally chosen was that of a lunar orbit rendezvous. This meant that a ship would launch from the Earth and stay in orbit around the moon while a smaller craft, a lunar landing module, descended to the lunar surface. The same lander would then ascend to bring the astronauts back to the mothership. This method had the added benefit of being able to use the lunar module as a lifeboat, a feature that came very handy when the oxygen tank exploded aboard Apollo 13. By 1967, following nearly 20 unmanned missions, equipment improvements, and nerve-wracking delays, NASA was ready to launch the first three Apollo astronauts to space. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. But Apollo 1 would never make its launch date. Disaster struck. When, during a training exercise, a fire broke out in the cockpit and all three men perished. Sixteen months later, after numerous changes to spacesuit and spaceship design, and three unmanned missions, NASA was again in a position to restart manned missions. Apollo 7 tested equipment in Earth orbit, and quickly thereafter Apollo 8 became the first lunar orbiting mission, sending pictures of the moon's surface to Earth via a live broadcast on Christmas Eve 1968. Apollo 8 uh, coming to you live from the moon. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type NASA got ever closer to its goal with each mission. And then finally, on June 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 made history by landing the first two humans on the moon. The Eagle has landed. Roger, twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took those first steps on an alien landscape. Watched over by their third teammate, Michael Collins, who was watching with anticipation from the orbiting mothership. A further 10 men set foot on the surface of the moon during the subsequent Apollo missions. Altogether, the Apollo astronauts spent tens of hours on the lunar surface, collecting hundreds of pounds of rocks and soil samples, and taking thousands of photos. The United States claimed the victor's crown in the space race, but the effects of the program reverberated throughout the world. The excitement of the mission, the tension and drama of the splashdown, they remain only in our memories and in time they'll be replaced in the future by other missions, other memories. The moments of Apollo may be over, but the understanding and the discovery, they go on. 
and the full meaning, the real meaning, may yet be in the future too. But for now, for the present, the images and the sounds provide meaning enough to each in his own way and to each in his own time.